So good afternoon. My name is Abby Edens, and I'm Director of Education at the National World War II Museum, and I want to welcome you to our Real History Filmmaker Talk featuring History Speaks, The Diary of a Generation. We are joined today by four of the individuals involved in creating this film, as well as our moderator, my colleague uh, from the World War II Museum, Dr. Kristen Burton, Teacher Programs and Curriculum Specialist. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Kristen and our panelists. All right. Thank you, Abby. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. We're excited to feature this short film today that is a part of a larger uh, film that will be released next year. More information coming on that. But briefly, I just want to introduce our panelists, what this film is, and what you can expect for the next hour. Uh, so. I'm not gonna go in any particular order because I'm sure the screen is different for me to everybody else, but I'm just gonna go down the list that I have here. But joining us today is a producer on the film, Sherry Doran, who is a Michigan native with a background in performing. She has worked with such companies as Making Up Productions, Wayne Brady, Warner Brothers, ABC, Universal Studios, and Princess Cruise Lines. Sherry has also co-written and produced an original play called The Basement. Uh, and it made its world premiere in California. She has written and produced a one woman show called Anne based on the life and writings of Anne Marl Lindbergh, which has toured across both coasts. Also joining us is producer Susan Cummings, who's a proud native of Cleveland, Ohio and a graduate of Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, she's a former stand up and improvisational uh, comedian who's performed shows on the East and West Coast and uh, a bit in between as well, uh, in comedy clubs and for companies, uh, including Universal Studios, Walt Disney World, and The Improv. Uh, Susan's also a freelance writer, producer, and director on various live shows. And Sherry and Susan together uh, founded an independent production company, Ponytail Fil Films, over 12 years ago. Uh, they are writing and producing partners, and they are currently in production on a new anthology web series called The Watch. Also on our panel today, we have director of photography, Kevin Blake, who is also an actor, writer, producer, and public speaker who has worked in a long series of film, uh, television, and theater productions for over 30 years. Um, looking up uh, his IMDb, it is quite the list, but just a few credits uh, that, you, that are, uh, you will see on uh, Kevin Blake's IMDb is uh, 2013's The Book of Daniel, uh, 2016 Mother's Day, and 2017 deadly detention. Uh, and also on our panel, we have editor Sean Blodgett, who is also producer, director, writer, and actor, and owner and operator of Creative Motion Entertainment. Through his production company, Sean provides creative production and production consulting, as well as video and audio production, post-production, and editorial, and overall uh, uh, content creation. <laughs> uh, Needless to say, our panelist has a long uh, career uh, collectively in the film industry and in pr performance and production. And we're excited to have them here today to talk about their new release, History Speaks, Diary of a Generation. Now, the overall film is a feature length documentary. It's compiling of stories of diverse members of the World War II generation. The greatest generation themselves gets to get to tell their stories of how seemingly ordinary people became extraordinary when faced with the realities of living in a world of war. This documentary honors those who lived during World War II by allowing them to tell their stories in their own words. It is produced by Ponytail Films. It's a feature film that has screened throughout the United States for the past two years and looks forward to in-house screening in 2021. First at the National World War II Museum, but it will be slated for release on Amazon in 2021. Very exciting. And today we are going to be showing you a segment called Hooray for Hollywood that looks specifically at the ways that Hollywood contributed to the war effort. And before we show you the clip, I just would like to invite the panel to give a few words of introduction to this segment uh, for the audience. And um, I'll hand it over to Sherry first to kick things off. All right, thank you, Dr. Virgin. thank you. Well, hello again, my name is Sherry and I am a producer and co-owner of Ponytail Films with Susan. And this segment uh, was a lot of fun for us because we are actually housed in California. And one of the main ideas when we were making this film was that we wanted to include the people 
that weren't necessarily soldiers, but what did everybody do to contribute to the war effort? And we stumbled upon the idea of like, well, let's go to Hollywood. What did Hollywood do? How did they contribute? And I think you'll find out in this segment that you'll watch that uh, they were a huge part of, of the movement of raising money and awareness and it actually contributing as soldiers too. Many people went to war that actually were in the industry. Um, so we were very excited to get these interviews. This is, you know, it's the dream factory. The, the, what they produced was movies. And so when World War II happens, they um, immediately change how they do business. Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't have much to add other than the fact that working on this project and getting to meet all of these people and see and learning about their relationship to the war. Um, and, and when you see the, the larger film next year, you'll see just what diversity we have represented, which is one of the reasons I was so proud to work on this film. But um, meeting, uh, meeting these people um, and sharing that time with them was really special. And I hope that you get a lot out of this segment. All right. Well, with the, those introductory notes, we'll go ahead and hand things over to um, our programs team to show this clip of the film. And then we'll come back after the, the uh, clip is finished, lasts about 15 minutes, 15. and we'll have, we'll have ourselves a, a Q&A where you can ask the filmmakers some questions directly. Enjoy. We are all honored by the presence of all the veterans of America's greatest generation, both military and those who served on the home front. I also want to thank the families of our men and women in uniform for your sacrifice and your support. You maintained the home front and kept the faith even during the darkest days. With the veterans of World War II, as with all wars, every face has its own personal story. centers, stars such as Ann Miller and Linda Darnell, John Garfield and Betty Davis are helping entertain servicemen, lovely Greer Garson, little Judy Garland, beautiful Hedy Lamar, popular Betty Grable. At home and abroad, people of the motion picture industry are trying to do their bit for fighting men of the United Nations. Hollywood made a giant contribution to the war effort in World War II. Training films, uh, there were all kinds of bases around here building top secret uh, uh, training films, or if they were going into a certain uh, country, uh, they would come out to Hollywood and say, give us a film showing what that country is really like, and, and somehow they did it. Uh, and. Uh, and Washington had an office out here that read all scripts. Uh, it wasn't censorship, but they could tell you, you shouldn't put that in a film. It might hurt the war effort. We did a picture here about nurses with Claudette Colbert and Paulette Goddard and Barbara Britton and Veronica Lake. And everything about the nurses in service, which were just very, very good. And we did a lot of uh, pictures that not only were absolutely, you knew were service pictures, but in, in a lot of the pictures, there was a little, some things in it. It was a very patriotic message. You know, those old moguls, they might have been scoundrels in some ways, but they were patriotic. The latest feature pictures made for theaters are reduced to 16 millimeter size for showings at army camps at home and overseas. Every week, Army planes transport 150 features, some 200 newsreels and short subjects to fighting forces around the world. 
And a lot of our people here at Paramount enlisted in service, whether writers, directors, producers, executives, cameramen, they wanted to volunteer their services, and immediately a lot of the people uh, enlisted. Yes, in democratic America, everybody is doing his bit. There goes Jimmy Stewart on his way to enlist. One of the most popular stars on the screen. Joining the Air Force as a private, Jimmy has now won promotion. Today, he's Lieutenant Stewart, USA. Moviegoers of years ago will remember Jackie Coogan. Charlie Chaplin made him famous as the kid. Well, Jackie's in the Air Force now, a staff sergeant and qualified glider pilot. A movie star of modern times is sworn into service. Tyrone Power, hero of many a daring exploit on the silver screens of the world. He'll now play his greatest role as a leatherneck marine. Clark Gable, at 41, renounces his throne as America's most popular film star to join the United States Army Air Force. Enlisting as a private, his ambition to become a crack aerial gunner in the crew of a bomber. May God bless you. Thank you. When the war bond drive came out, I took a, mop, a mock up of a bomb and brought it here. And I, it took me about 10 days because I went to every studio in town and I had something like 89 famous names sign this bomb. We got, uh, as I remember, about a million and a half dollars for that bomb. Also, our stars went on bond drives. And, God, you had, you had James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, Ben Cross, all going out on these drives. Yes, movie stars arriving in Washington to help sell war bonds are all working for the same cause. The parade down Pennsylvania Avenue is a pageant of patriotism. Bing Crosby in a scout car. Jimmy Cagney. Abbott and Costello, popular comedians of stage, screen, and radio. They all assemble on the Treasury steps to launch the drive for funds. Greer Garson, Jimmy Cagney, Ann Rutherford, Irene Dunn, Hedy Lamar. And how that crowd lines up to buy bonds from their favorites. They buy knowing that every dollar invested helps send more planes, tanks, and ships to the United Nations. This is the people's way of saying, from the home front to the battlefront, from movie stars to sales clerks, America's 130 million citizens are in the war. USO did a great job. It was a wonderful place to go. And then back in those days, the young actresses were called starlets, and they all went there and danced with their troops. I went there, I stood in line. I uh, made three or four different trips there. And uh, you know, you could dance with Betty Grable or Rita Hayworth. Or, uh, you know, the same images are in your arm, only it's real, that is in your footlocker. You know, you got your foot locker. You, you always love to leave your foot locker open. And if you had an autographed picture of one of them, or uh, my God, if you had a picture of you with them, you were the king. There were several canteens here. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Hollywood canteen, the best known, of course. And then there was a wonderful lady named Mom Lear. And uh, her husband was an executive, uh, I believe, at MGM. And she got a canteen going, and she uh, provided housing. She got a lot of cots and all that stuff, and she could house a lot of people. And then right over here at Hollywood High School, they had a new gymnasium, and the parents and the students would uh, fill the gym full of cots on the weekend, and they could handle several hundred. Uh, people in there and they would give GIs a place to sleep and then on Sunday morning they would all get together and provide a big breakfast for them before they went back to camp. So Hollywood was completely involved in the war effort in World War II, the community and the industry. So I was, when I was a, as a private and they made me a corporal and they made me a sergeant in public relations. And then they sent me down to officer candidate school in, in Miami to uh, become a, an officer. And that was, that was probably the roughest, I forgot whether it's three months or four months now, but that was the roughest time of my life because I was never athletic and physical person. At six feet, 145, I'm a little thin. 
And uh, we went through those obstacle courses. I don't know, except other people helped me. They did it. And then uh, I was about halfway through. And I, I don't think I was very military because I'm just I'm not, I'd rather shake hands and salute and things. And at OCS. And uh, I didn't think I was doing too well. I scribbled a note to Bob Hope and uh, said, I was there, help, I need your help. <laughs> so he, so he, um, he did help and he, and, yeah, and he called the commanding officer and said, uh, I'll do a show because you got my good friend A.C. Lyles there. And that got me to the tents of the commanding officer. During the war on my off-duty time in New York at 5.30 to 7 every morning, I didn't have to be at work until late. I was on for an hour and a half on WINS in New York, and I did a disc jockey uh, interview program called Strictly GI, beamed to the uh, troops stationed around uh, the greater New York area. Man, it was a lot of them. And then I would get all the celebrities that came from Hollywood would get up and come down there. And all of the celebrities coming home from uh, the uh, USO tours, from the European theater, uh, Humphrey Bogart, people like that, and then little Jane Withers uh, would come in, and uh, Linda Darnell and people like that. So from, from 5.30 until 7, I was in heaven. Then I had to go to work. But, you know, I was the sergeant. <laughs> there was one tragedy that I saw later on firsthand. Carol Lombard was one of our biggest stars, and she had married Clark Gable, wonderful man, who later went in service. And Carol did not like to fly, and she went on a bond drive with her mother and a publicist called Otto Winkler who was at Metro Goldwyn Mayor. He wasn't with the Paramount, he was at Metro Goldwyn Mayor. And they were coming back, and I think they were in Arizona, Flagstaff or Albuquerque, and Clark called Carol and expressed to her how much he, how lonesome he was without her and how much he loved her and those things. And when he hung up, Carol was so affected, and they had, reservations on the train to come back to Los Angeles. And she was so anxious to get back after hearing Clark's plead how much he was missing her, that they decided they'd flip a coin to see whether they would go by train or fly. It came up heads, and that was a plane. They got reservations on the plane. Carol, her mother, and Otto. The plane crashed, and all three of them were killed. after taking off as president, leads his country finally to victory and peace. And the flash came through that the war is over. Well, the band got right up and started parading down Hollywood Boulevard. The merchants came out, uh, GIs uh, in their uniform, uh, went into stores and the merchants gave them civilian ties they were wearing with their uniform. And before you knew it, 100,000 people had gathered at Hollywood and Vine. And then, all of a sudden, this big, long Cadillac convertible shows up, and a petite little thing jumps out, and you know, they have those, uh, uh, the back end of those, uh, were very long, the, uh, the trunk uh, cover, and she jumped up on the back and started doing her wiggles and all that, and it was Carmen Miranda, uh, who the GIs loved, you know, with those fruity hats and all that stuff. And uh, I, I guess uh, it was pandemonium down there. And they, they confiscated uh, the uh, red trolley line that we used to have. The troops were riding up and down the street yelling. And I guess a few beers were flowing and everybody had a great time. It was all over. <laughs> I bet when I first started, you thought I was going to be lousy, huh? <laughs> oh, I missed it entirely. Oh, this is your 
enjoyed that clip. Um, the Q&A is now open. If you have any questions for any of the filmmakers who helped bring this clip and the larger uh, documentary to life, feel free to enter those questions into the Q&A box. Uh, but as you all enter those questions, I just want to open things up a bit to the panel uh, overall. If you all could just speak to the role that you see Hollywood playing in military con American military conflicts. And is this something that extends beyond World War II or do you see World War II as a unique case, a unique example of the role that Hollywood and Hollywood celebrities uh, played in either supporting or contributing to the war effort? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, I think for me, uh, World War II is probably the time when Hollywood was able to contribute the most. I think um, even Johnny Grant and later in his interview um, in the clip that we didn't end up using, he mentions that nowadays to do something like a war bond effort in Hollywood would be just too difficult by the time you got through studios and agents and managers and hangers on and you know whatever else. But uh, I don't know. I think there was, the, it was a unique situation in that not only was it, um, you know, trotting out all the biggest names, there were writers and directors and uh, folks who work in the scene shops and, you know, talk about the ghost armies and, and all of those things, which I think was really um, probably a singular time during World War II. Not to say that Hollywood hasn't contributed since then, but I think World War II was really kind of the epitome of that contribution. I also want to throw in, uh, in general, I think that that unity was was apparent throughout all of it. I mean, there, there was a large sense of unity and a unified voice uh, and and sort of methodology in terms of how people were were working together. And as Susan stated, it, it's just it's so different now. There's a lot more. I mean, good or bad, right or wrong, a lot more just individuality that makes it so much more difficult to create that unified message, that unified voice that's really going to make that difference. Um, I mean, you do hear people speaking out individually, but I think together, you know, any kind of unity is a stronger thing. You know, I, I think I, I would add just one quick little bit to that. I think or I wonder, I guess, and maybe Dr. Burton, this is a question for you. It, you know, because there was a draft, you know, I mean, there, you were gonna get involved in the war effort. I mean, I just wonder how that affected the numbers, you know? 
Yeah, I think uh, that, that ties into the broader points that both of you all made in that World War II was unique. Uh, it was this coming off the heels of World War I, which the United States did get involved in at, at, at a later point in the conflict. The World War II, uh, it's, it struck a chord in that it did affect everybody in a way that World War I didn't and mm -hmm. uh, subsequent conflicts haven't. Uh, everyone from children on the home front to uh, individuals who were drafted and sent abroad, everyone was affected in some way by World War II. Uh, but the draft is an interesting point to bring up because we're uh, at the museum, we have a special exhibit on the Ghost Army, which you mentioned, which is that it was a theatrical production taken to the front line of the war. And for anyone who isn't familiar, the Ghost Army in a nutshell was a, a unit uh, or a division of actors, sound engineers, fashion designers, artists, illustrators, uh, all kinds of individuals, many of them with connections and backgrounds in Hollywood who manufactured the sounds and uh, the, you know, kind of the appearance of military movement. So the Nazis would think oh, allied troops are, are going to come over here. And, and they had these sound trucks to make it sound like tanks were driving by and they had inflatable tanks and inflatable planes, anything to throw the enemy off. It was an act of deception done through theater. And they had nothing too, which is kind of a remarkable thing about the ghost army. They, they didn't have weapons to fire back. Like they may have had a machine gun on their own person and that was it. So if anyone started you know, the tank fire came their way. They had absolutely nothing to defend themselves, but they had, admit, had to make it look like there were thousands of men amassing. And that was Hollywood. And that was Hollywood on the front line in, an, in another way. And there, there is one guy who takes credit for the ghost army uh, being, being his, you know, his brainchild. Um, and his name is, um, it's Captain uh, Ralph Ingersoll. And he was a Hollywood guy. He was also um, like a, a celebrity journalist too, but he had all these ties up in Hollywood. Um, so he was drafted and initially was kind of resistant to, oh, I don't want to do this. But then when he was drafted, he was like, he kind of came around. He was like, no, I need to do something and became involved in deception units over in Britain and then helped bring that idea to the United States. Although he did claim sole credit, it's, it's clear it was a team effort. <laughs> <laughs> but so I think these, these all tie in. <laughs> Say that again, Sid. I said claiming credit is also very Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think a lot of these factors kind of combined for um, these end results. But uh, I think it is very clear that, as you all said, World War II is a unique example. Uh, Sherry, I don't know if you all have anything that you want to throw in here. We've got a couple questions coming in. Well, I, I, I will add, I think if, if you wanted to talk about how it's extended to today, it, it actually, um, because of technology changing during World War II, cameras were now filming a war. That I mean, they were primitive cameras, but they were in there, um, you know, filming. And that had kind of extended into the next wars as, as technology changed. Now we in the United States could see the war instead of just hear it on the radio or see pictures of it in the paper. Um, and I think that's how Hollywood remained kind of in it um, and started filming and made films about it as, as well as you know working with the war efforts. And I just, uh, I wanted to add that I think that Hollywood in, in subsequent uh, wars and uh, more current times used their celebrity to, to draw attention to issues and atrocities around the world or to make their uh, op opinions and feelings about uh, wars known. It might not be uh, all in unity, there might be dissent, but using their celebrity in those ways, sometimes personally or sometimes through the work that they're creating, um, certainly I think has an impact on how we can see uh, what's going on in different areas of the world. And I also wanted to add that though we found so much uh, unity in this generation around this effort, at the same time, there were uh, Americans who were being locked up in Japanese internment camps and um, African-American soldiers who were uh, treated unfairly. So there was this great sense of unity, but I 
want to sort of underscore that um, it wasn't it wasn't the same for everybody. Absolutely, and an essential uh, point to remember because we do, I think, have these ideas that can kind of simplify these notions of patriotism that came out of World War II. And, you know, as Japanese Americans are incarcerated, there's also uh, units of Japanese American soldiers who go on to uh, take on some of the heaviest losses in areas like Italy. Um, the 100th Battalion is a good example of that, came known as the Purple Heart uh, Battalion because they took so many losses. Uh, so thank you for pointing that out. It's a critical uh, critical uh, thing to bring up. But we do have some questions coming in. Um, so, oh, and uh, just to kind of add on to something that you mentioned, Sherry, uh, someone mentioned in the Q&A box, because you talked about the technology being such an important factor uh, with World War II because it had just advanced by that point. Um, and someone pointed out too, you know, the role of that same technology in affecting the discourse around subsequent wars like Vietnam and how moving pictures uh, affected the way people came to understand and, and view these conflicts. So that's another critical point as well. But we have a question from Arthur Bush from Melbourne, Australia. Hello to Australia, for, thank you for tuning in. No idea what time it is there. <laughs> um, but Arthur asks, and this is kind of a technical question in, in terms of actually putting the film together. Uh, why you uh, opted to have uh, this interview style approach uh, in putting the film together rather than a voice or voice over narrative that may uh, kind of tie the film together in, in a different way. What, what do you all think about that? Um, I'll, I'll jump in here. Uh, so the inspiration for me uh, prior to Sherry and I having a conversation about if we were even gonna make this film uh, I had found myself uh, in uh, Honolulu on the 60th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And just by nature of being there, uh, you know, you would see folks of a certain age who were clearly survivors. Uh, there'd be gentlemen with hats on that uh, with their signi insignia of the vessel they served on. And you would see a group of people around them uh, with this little man in the middle just telling his story. And I was very struck by that. And I thought uh, it would be interesting to get just the stories of those people. You know, there's not, there's not a, a narrator leading us through it. It is just, where were you on December 7th and let them tell their story. And so as that's kind of the notion we went in with. And then as we started editing it together, it just seemed like anything we added kind of got in the way of that. Um, that's my take on that, Sherry, if you want to, or Kevin, if you want to jump in. No, I, no, I can continue with that. It's, 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 it's kind of their, um, since it was their story, it's kind of their love letter to their life and sharing their story back to their family and our, you know, audience to see. Um, and like Susan said, we felt like we kind of got in the way when we started. And, and also what I, we will say, cause I know we saw just a segment, the, the film is segmented um, and, and it actually works to, to kind of the flow because we did start with each person where were you December 7th. So even though there's 119 people, they're still kind of telling the same story all the way through um, of, of how the war affected ordinary people and what they became. I'll just I'll just add that we you know there was no agenda. Uh, this was really about you know uh, this generation and 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 sadly as time goes we're losing this generation and to hear their voices and their stories and capture them um, and to let it be in their own words we thought was was really powerful to 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 capture that on film. Yeah, you know I think I'll add on to what Kevin's saying too is there's something about seeing someone of that age talking about their past. Um, and I guess uh, maybe uh, emotionally or sentimentally, I thought it might be a way to maybe remind folks that you may be standing next to a hero in the grocery store. And so that's that was another reason to kind of stay away from that mechanism of a narrator. All right, uh, thank you for that. And I that last point you raised, Susan, that, that is poignant um, in that we don't always know individual stories. Um, and 
in passing encounters, you, you never know if you're just walking by someone who survived through, who knows what harrowing events on the front line uh, of World War II or possibly liberated a concentration camp or something like that. Something that is totally unspeakable, uh, unthinkable. And, but, and they are quickly leaving us. So yeah, capturing their voices while we still can. And that is one of the big missions also of the uh, National World War II Museum. We do have another question uh, from Claire on Facebook. Uh, there's a few questions within this question. So <clears throat> uh, in your opinion, who was the most prominent figure for the war effort in Hollywood during World War II? And who was the most prominent figure in Hollywood for the military sphere today? So we can, we can start with the first question <laughs> if you want, so we can break that up. But in terms of the, the most prominent figure for the war effort for, in Hollywood during World War II? Um, that's, ooh, that's a really good question. You know, I'm, I'm always gonna default to Bob Hope. Uh, he just came up a lot. Uh, his name would come up and um, uh, it just seemed like he either knew, knew everyone or he was willing to help anyone. I mean, AC Lyles even tells the story. I'm, I'm in Texas, help. You know, and so I, I, to me, I think it's Bob Hope during that time. I'll have to think about part two. That's a good one. John, I know you have an opinion. Um, no, I, I, I was just listening to you. I, I totally agree. I, I think Bob Hope is, is in many ways sort of the poster child, I think, of, of that Hollywood war effort, support of the troops, uh, and I think that voice that 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 I don't know I don't know if he really started that during that time especially I mean he was the he was the face of that and I think that moved into you know next generations and support of troops and that kind of stuff so absolutely in terms of today boy that's a tough one I, I don't I don't even know uh, I do want to note somebody in the the chat said Frank Capra and that's such a great point um, I. Yeah, and shame on me for not thinking of that because that he's actually one that's kind of in retrospect. He just believed in in what America was so much, and his films would kind of sometimes not even subtly uh, reflect what he thought of America. And so I, I that's a great a great name is was uh, is Frank Capra. That's a good choice. You know, I think nowadays, what you know, Gary Sinise, and of course, you know, Tom Hanks. I um, I have to get my little plug in. I worked on the the uh, Beyond All Boundaries Theater, and had a chance to you know talk to Tom Hanks. And I've often thought about um, he was he was kind of like the Bob Hope, right? I mean, he got all the actors to do the voices in the film, and he's <laughs> he, he's he's just a great guy. But he's like, I'll take care of that. Don't worry. And and he did. So I, yeah, Tom Hanks, Gary Sinise, those guys are, are pretty strong. I was going to say, as, as far as Hollywood today, I think it is individuals, like you said, the Tom Hanks and Gary, um, that they, you know, band of brothers, you know, they make the things that are important uh, to preserve those stories and they make sure that they get made because I think they have the power in Hollywood to do that today. I don't know that the studio directly does it, but the, what, the individuals that can do it are doing it. Um, I also think we, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. No, no, absolutely. Go ahead. Thank you. I was just going to say just real quick, I also think that the voice that Bob Hope and, and other entertainers like him brought during that time had an effect moving forward to even, you know, no name entertainers. I mean, there's all kinds of entertainment, you know, that that is provided for troops and that kind of stuff, you know, to keep the morale up and that, you know, so I, I think that's an important point as well that aside from having celebrity involvement there's just this sense of like let's keep the morale up let's keep the energy up let's keep the positivity up this is a tough situation let's make some people smile yeah absolutely and and to, to speak to about tom hanks and gary sinise both uh longtime friends of the museum um tom hanks's involvement in beyond all boundaries really kind of helped put the museum on a national stage in a way that um it, it was uh moving toward but really helped to get there um, but Gary Sinise regularly brings veterans to the museum, or at least, you know, before everything happened in this past year uh, through his Soaring Valor program. And it's been really, um, really heartwarming to see not just World War II veterans coming 
to the museum to see their to stories told, but they've also paired uh, World War II veterans up with high school students. So you can have these intergenerational conversations happening as the veterans move through the museum. They are, are accompanying every step of the way with um, high school students. Um, I think the last trip they brought students from the Chicago area, uh, but this has been a longstanding uh, relationship partnership with uh, the Gary Sinise Foundation and uh, the National World War II Museum. And it's been really heartwarming to see, especially um, given that, as mentioned before, our time with these veterans is, is, is limited. So to make the most of it while we can. Um, and Bob Hope, of course, we had a special exhibit on Bob Hope. Uh, it, it, it goes without saying that the man went everywhere during World War II running his USO shows uh, and, and probably performed to more people in his entire career than probably anyone else. Um, we do have another question from uh, Facebook from Urs uh, Schmid. Can you all talk about the propaganda campaign that uh, Germany ran? I'm guessing that is in reference to German Germany's own film propaganda. And um, I'll just add to this, you know, how did Hollywood counteract uh, Nazi efforts to run their own propaganda films? Um, so that's a good question. Uh, I, we are not historians. And uh, so my answer is, is merely going to be supposition and, and are the fringe answers that we kind of got from our interviews. Uh, so, you know, Johnny Grant talks about uh, the DC uh, uh, folks coming to Hollywood and having an office there. There was a very definite, uh, you know, review of scripts that happened. Uh, sometimes it was in to answer a question of something that was going on in Germany. Uh, um, I have limited uh, understanding of like the Weimar Republic and, the, and their campaigns. And um, there was a, this is getting off track just a little bit. There was a great exhibit at the LA County Museum of Art about the Weimar Republic and their, the way they perpetuated their messages in film, uh, particularly uh, the propaganda films and, and the, the graphics. And uh, so that my, re my very uh, limited knowledge answer is that the, there was a group from Washington that made a point to read the scripts to make sure the messages were very clear. Um, and that was, that's basically the extent. So Dr. Burton, this may be also on you, tag team. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can speak to as much as I can. I don't know, Sherry, do you have, do you have anything you wanted to, to throw in there as well? No, I, I, th I think it was about that. I, I had it on. Um, it really was about <laughs> that office that uh, that um, DC put there, you know, that our government had there. And I think they did um, kind of parlay back and forth watching what was going on in Germany. And, and that's how they made their scripts. You know, it, it was part of it. Yeah. So, I mean, Joseph Goebbels, the, the propaganda machine that came out of Nazi Germany was formidable, to be sure. Um, and I'm from what I know, this is not something I've studied directly, but um, they went out of their ways to try to recruit as many high profile German uh, celebrities as they could, but um, it didn't always work because many of these celebrities did not support um, Hitler or the Third Reich. Um, a prominent example of this is Marlena Dietrich, who uh, Hitler personally was very interested in securing uh, for Nazi films and she fled to America and she became an active participant and supporter of USO shows and uh, became uh, an integral part of the Hollywood scene. Uh, and she came to America because she was not going to participate um, in, in what was happening in Germany. Uh, there, there's numerous other examples of that as well. So uh, I think we can see there is um, action and reaction in terms of what happens uh, with propaganda films coming out of Germany and then what comes out of Hollywood. Um, and I think uh, someone in the Q&A mentioned Casablanca. That's yeah. a great example um, yeah, happening while the war's still going on. Mm -hmm. But it also, I think, changes the way, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but Hollywood probably saw itself as a, an influencer in terms of um, larger national military initiatives. Because uh, as far as I know, I mean, Hollywood was just really coming up when something like World War I was happening. And uh, it had money and technology and, and, and influence that it didn't previously have before with World War II. Mm -hmm. So I think 
you know, and, and I, I could be wrong, because again, I'm not, I'm not a film historian, but um, I've always kind of interpreted the, you know, the elevation of through film, newsreels, and other um, uh, USO shows, things discuss the war bond drives in your film clip, yeah. uh, really elevated Hollywood to a new level of prominence because of the war. Yeah, it's interesting. There's um, there's a definite uh, wave of talent that comes from Germany and, and Eastern Europe in general around that time. And you, you, know, you talk about Marlena Dietrich and Peter Lorre, and there's a bunch, there's a lot of you know very prominent actors. And you look through an old Warner Brothers cast list of it, you know of any film, and you'll see that um, there is a there's a really interesting photo of uh, it's an aerial photo of Warner Brothers Studios from back in the day because the Burbank airport today was a Lockheed Martin facility during the war. And there, they had painted a huge arrow to the left, it pointed to the left and said, you know, Lockheed this way, because the sound stages look like airplane hangers and they didn't want to get, <laughs> they didn't want bombs dropped on them. Um, and I, I will say too that, you know, it was really almost, this is probably an oversimplification, but it was almost like a, a switch was flipped on December 8th. And you know the the films that were being made were you know they they were hygiene films and training films and you know just it was everyone using their expertise for the war effort and that just was almost immediate that was like seems to be the thing that Hollywood could do was to use all of these resources and and push forward the war effort and that that's kind of what I took from it. Yeah. Uh, so one more question, and then um, we'll, we'll wrap things up here. This may be a bit of a shot in the dark because I'm not familiar with this uh, specific name, but we'll throw it out to the panel and see if it rings a bell. Uh, but Jonathan from Facebook asked, is there any knowledge of a Colonel Jim Hunter who was a liaison for USO shows? Uh, I, that name does not ring a bell to me, but I'm going to look it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah. I'm intrigued. Yeah, I, mean, I wish there was a little more, more, if Jonathan's still watching, if you want to throw some more uh, context, I'm curious as well. Uh, right. But that's the nice thing about these discussions and Q and A's is right. like, well, I'm not familiar with this, but I'm, I'm going to look into that further. Right. Yeah. All right, well, uh, do any of you all have any closing remarks or just any final thoughts you want to share about the broader film or the segment we watched specifically today? Because I do know the film is going to become available on Amazon next year. So what is something that people can look forward to in watching the full documentary? Um, I, I would uh, kind of uh, tag team onto what Kevin said. You know, we, we did start the interviews with Where Were You December 7th. And for some folks, that didn't mean the best time of their lives. But for some folks, it did. Um, and it didn't always mean that someone enlisted in a branch of the military. Sometimes it was, you know, the women who stayed home and played baseball for the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Uh, we talked to the Japanese Americans who were in the internment camps and what that meant for them. We have a super compelling interview uh, with the Tuskegee Airmen and we spent a lot of time with Roger Teary, who I know also has a connection to the World War II Museum. When I was working in New Orleans, I got off the plane and there were banners with his picture on them hanging from the lampposts. And I was like, hey, I know that guy. Um, so I think there's a broader, uh, scope to the larger film that I'm excited for everyone to see. And I think, um, you know, all the folks on this panel will agree. I mean, it was just the four of us. And so uh, um, we're excited to, to get a broader audience and excited to be at the museum next year. Yes, and, and I'll, I'll go on that also that uh, it was, it was an honor for the four of us to really um, be included in someone's home and their their families that they shared these stories with us. Uh, you know, we we captured these stories probably what almost fourteen years ago. So they were in their eighties, and it was an interesting time to interview them because some of them had never spoke of it, um, and they were at that point in their life where they really wanted to tell that story, and they're very articulate in telling that story at that age. Um, so I, I feel very honored, and and um, I'm excited to share. Uh, these stories that I think some people may not have seen. I'd just say uh, that uh, if you get an opportunity to see the, the larger film, there are just some really compelling personal stories. Um, there is a, a, a story of a, of a prisoner of war um, uh, in Germany who ends up befriending one of the German soldiers and their relationship um, 
they they reconnect after the war. It, it's it's really just one of the many powerful little nuggets uh, that um, is a story that I haven't heard before and uh, just really powerful. So I hope you get a chance. And just the the memories I have of of making the film, not only the memories of working together with this team, uh, traveling. Um, but having that opportunity to share that space with these people who did incredible things or experienced incredible things um, is, is pretty powerful. And I'm, I'm blessed to have been a part of it um, and, and cherish those memories. And I hope that um, their stories get heard um, uh, and seen by as many people as possible because they're really powerful. I'll just briefly uh, second uh, what Kevin just said. I mean, it's powerful is the word that comes to mind. I mean, I came on later in the process, um, but just all these stories, personal things you haven't heard before, uh, relative to you know things that are happening today. Uh, it, it's a it's a powerful piece, especially in its entirety. There is a I, I think that there is a a strong through line when you see the whole thing together. I mean, it works in segments, but it but when you see it all together, you you get this sense. Uh, of these people's lives and, and you and it does it does change you and, and so I think it's a powerful piece and I'm also very grateful to, to be a part of it. All right fantastic and just a quick follow-up from Jonathan on Facebook he said that Colonel Jim Hunter uh, worked uh, for Bob Hope so I guess that is the connection. <laughs> oh okay. Something to look into and 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 you're you're giving us a nice research project Jonathan. So you, you know that. I'll check that out because it was their foundation that gave us all that footage. We had to go to them directly so I'll I'll, I'll hunt that down because I'm still in contact with them. I'll Perfect. see if I can find out. <laughs> all right well my thanks to Sherry, Susan, Kevin, Sean for joining us today and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Please do check out the full documentary uh, hopefully one day we'll be able to gather in person to screen it at the museum, fingers next crossed, year. next year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the very least, you can watch the full thing on Amazon in 2021. Do check it out. And uh, my thanks to uh, everyone from uh, Ponytail Films coming in and showcasing your years long work. So thank you very much. And again, thank you to the audience for tuning in today. Uh, and with that, we'll go ahead and say, I do. Have a good day and everyone take care. Stay safe. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.